everyone for coming. Uh, as some of you know, I'm uh, currently uh, outside the academia, so it's uh, quite nice to have the chance to remain active and uh, share some work. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, human biological sex, and in particular I will uh, be discussing um, and analyzing an ongoing debate on whether it is uh, appropriate or not to characterize sex as uh, binary. I don't know how familiar you are with these uh, debates or debates um, closely connected to this one, but I guess that some of you sometimes might have heard claims uh, according to which uh, there are more than two sexes, or perhaps uh, people defending that sex should be conceptualized as a spectrum. So in this case, I'm going to focus, although these are different variants, I believe, of the same debate, I will be focusing, uh, focusing specifically on on this uh, specific characterization of uh, binary. And uh, as you will see, there se seems to be a quite a strong uh, disagreement uh, between people that insist on characterizing sex as binary and people who insist on characterizing it as non-binary or, or um, who defend that sex is not um, binary. So uh, what I do in this paper uh, is analyze this uh, discussion and I will try to argue that actually framing this debate in these terms, asking whether sex is binary or not, actually uh, leads to a false dilemma. A false dilemma where I will argue that both uh, possible answers, in this case both the positive and the negative uh, answers, are not appropriate and this is uh, the sense in which I believe we can um, see this uh, question as leading, conducing us to a false dilemma where we are presented as only with two choices where actually none of them is uh, satisfactory. Another problem that I try to identify as well with this sort of uh, framework has to do with um, sex pluralism. In particular, we'll try to argue that um, asking this question, using this framework to engage in this debate, um, is assuming sex monism the idea that there is only one appropriate or valid concept of, se of, of sex. And I will try to, uh, through an analogy with another uh, concept, the species concept in biology, I will try to argue that actually uh, sex pluralism might be a better and more fruitful alternative. So this is the uh, structure of the paper. First, I will try to do a very broad overview of some of the contenders in this debate for you to have a, a general idea of, of what's going on and how people express uh, the views and how people express whether sex is binary or not. Uh, then I will try to uh, formulate what I take to be the most uh, relevant facts uh, at the bottom of this discussion. Uh, this uh, was uh, particularly uh, tricky when writing the paper because I think that, as I will try to show, often the um, disagreement um, arises more at the level of concepts and terminology. And so when I formulated these facts, I tried to do so without using uh, loaded or controversial terms. And so once I uh, present these uh, facts, I go on again to analyze some of the authors involved in this debate, and I tried to show that actually, against um, what first appearances would suggest, these authors uh, do not disagree when it comes to the relevant facts. So despite of characterizing sex as binary or not binary, they all agree, I argue, with the relevant biological facts. And this, I will suggest, that um, uh, points to attention in how binary the term binary is being used, and this will allow me to explain in more detail how this can lead to the uh, already mentioned false dilemma, and then uh, I will discuss sex monism and how pluralism might be a better alternative. So first, very broad overview of the dispute. First, some authors who characterize sex as not binary. First, we have Claire Ainsworth, who publishes this in Nature. She claims the idea of two sexes is simplistic. Biologists now think there is a wider spectrum than that. Then we have Foster Stelling, a biologist who has been working on this for more than 20 years now. Uh, in a piece published in the um, uh, New York Times, 
the piece is uh, entitled Why Sex is Not Binary. Uh, she says, two sexes have never been enough to describe human variety. It has long been known that there is no single biological measure to that unassailably places each and every human into one of two categories, male or female. And lastly, uh, San, who publishes this in uh, Scientific American, uh, says actual research shows that sex is anything but binary. So this we have on one side of the dispute. Then authors who uh, claim or defend the thesis that uh, sex is binary. Uh, first we have Alex Byrne, who uh, uh, defends that there are only two sexes which are not that difficult to identify. And he says specifically females produce large gametes and males produce small ones. Since there are no species with a third intermediate gamete size, there are only two sexes. This is what, what Byrne says. And lastly, another author on this side of the dispute, Kathleen Stock, who published a book in 2021. And in the book, she devotes a whole chapter to defend the idea that sex is binary. And she says, binary sex exists, Human, humans are divided into females and males, and this binary division is a natural state of affairs rooted in stable biological facts. So as you can see, there seems to be quite a contrasting uh, debate here. Um, often those positioned in this side of the debate uh, seem to be uh, defending that uh, the other side, people arguing that sex is not binary, are moved by a uh, political agenda and so on. Um, but uh, in any case, as you can see, most of them, if not all, uh, tend to also um, mention that actual research and scientific knowledge actually backs their positions, right? So now that we have a very general idea of the, of the dispute, let me uh, introduce what I take to be the relevant biological facts. Right? And then I will try to show how indeed many of these authors agree with these facts. Uh, there might be a bit dense, but uh, it's important. Is it too small, maybe? Well, I will, I will read it, and if there is something you don't understand, please ask, because uh, later on in the talk I will be relying a lot on these two, two facts. So this is the first one that I call dimorphism. It says some species reproduce sexually by fusing a relatively large gamete with a relatively small gamete. So this is within the species that reproduce sexually. Some of them don't, um, but uh, in the cases uh, where they do, there, there is this already this distinction between those who produce relatively large gametes and those who produce relatively small gametes. Many of those species exhibit uh, uh, further morphological differences associated with the production of each of these two gamete types, right? In the case of humans, producing relatively large gametes tends to cluster with other physiological properties, such as having excess chromosome, having a vagina, having ovaries, having certain levels of hormones, and uh, so on. Um, whereas producing relatively small gametes tend to cluster with other physiological properties, such as having XY chromosomes, having a penis, having testes, and so on. Is this clear? Yes? Okay, so this would be the first uh, relevant biological fact. The second one I call non-exhaustivity. Uh, the clustering of the property of producing one of the two gamete types and the other physiological properties typically associated with it, although statistically disproportionate, is not strict. That is, sometimes properties which in the vast majority of cases are associated with one of these two gametes co-occur with the other gamete. As such, there are individuals who instantiate properties of both clusters and thus cannot be located in either of them. In other words, the two groups of people that each uh, have one gamete type and the properties typically associated with it do not exhaust the entire population. Right, so we have uh, two significant properties, that of producing a relatively large gamete and producing a relatively small gamete. And then we have uh, other properties typically associated in the vast majority of cases with one of these two properties. But this um, clustering is not strict 
as there are individuals who produce or uh, instantiate properties of both clusters. And uh, another situation would be uh, as well cases where individuals um, do not instantiate the, uh, the typical, uh, none of the typical properties. For instance, if we take into, cons into consideration chromosomes, uh, the typical feature would be in one case uh, XX chromosome, in the other XY, uh, but there are individuals who uh, have XXY chromosome, for instance. So in this case, it's not that an individual has properties of both clusters, but there is a property which has uh, the non-typical non -typical form. But the other one, I mean, the main gamut thing, the small, the small bit, there was uh, one thing with no intermediate. Yes. That's not exception. I mean, there is two gamma types and only two gamma types. Yeah, Everyone it's, has one idea. Uh, uh, there are, I, I mean, we can discuss this later on as well, but uh, the thing is that here we should also clarify that not in all the stages of their life individuals produce these gametes. And sometimes it, it is very rare, but there has, are been cases where individuals have uh, an ovary and a testis. And in this case, um, uh, they could produce both. Uh, also, there are not cases where this... Um, have the way to, let's say, because if one individual can produce both uh, gamete types, theoretically it could be the case that one could get themselves pregnant. But what there have not been documented cases is uh, cases where these two uh, gametes could encounter and you know, produce offspring and so on. So this, uh, the relevant other questions about this? Okay, so now uh, the idea is to try to show how, uh, despite appearances and despite the very different characterization of sex, all the authors, at least those uh, I, have, I have considered, agree with these facts. So here we have Foster Stelling again. Uh, Foster Stelling says, says, on close inspection, absolute dimorphism disintegrates even at the level of basic biology. Chromosomes, hormones, the internal sex structures, the gonad and the external genitalia all vary more than most people realize. Those born outside the platonic dimorphic mold are called intersexuals. So at least in this quote, we can see this as an attempt to emphasize non-exhaustivity, to emphasize the non-strict covariation of sex properties. But as well, uh, Foster Stelling says, complete maleness and complete femaleness represent the extreme ends of a spectrum of possible body types, that these extreme ends are the most frequent, as lend credence to the idea that they are not only natural, but normal. Knowledge of biological variation, however, allows us to conceptualize the least, less frequent middle spaces as natural, although statistically unusual. So here, also, although she insists on the idea uh, that complete maleness and complete femaleness are uh, the extremes, she uh, concedes uh, in a way that these extreme ends are the more frequent one. Yes, so in a sense, we can safely say that she concedes uh, dimorphism as well. Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, you might be about to come to this, and if so, just tell me. Um, the proposition on the table is sex is binary, sex is not binary. I know what binary means. What does sex mean? Uh, in this context? Uh, it depends. Uh, for instance... Does it mean surface features, etc., etc., et, cetera, et, cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will discuss this a bit more later, but uh, for instance, uh, in some domains of biology, uh, it could be argued that sex is a reproductive strategy. Yeah, that's the VYP. Uh, and so in, the, in uh, some cases, having this... Um, uh, way to understand sex is particularly useful and appropriate. What I will try to argue actually later on that there might be other meaning of sex that we might uh, we might find useful to use in other contexts apart from this. Uh, okay, so the, um, can I take away that the question of is sex binary turns significantly on what you mean by sex? Um, sure, yeah, and what do you mean by binary as well? Because uh, as I will try to show, there might be uh, as well different interpretations. Okay, so uh, as you can see, well, the strategy I will consider four authors, and uh, the, strategy, the strategy will be try to uh, show that they are actually, all of them agree with, this, uh, with these facts. Although, as you will see, 
in general, the tendency will be to emphasize uh, one of the two. All right. So the second author is a Polish uh, philosopher, uh, Katharina Zdieminska, and uh, uh, she says a simple binary female male divide is a kind of epistemic oversimplification that ignores a great deal of empirical data about people with intersex traits. And then on, she, her goal or her, one of her main concerns and one of the things she has discussed is one of the effects that this might have, uh, cases where uh, newborns uh, exhibit uh, these sort of intersex features and for many years one of the procedures was this so-called normalizing surgery and she claimed that this normalizing surgery is the expression and reinforcement of epistemic injustice as it is a visible physical harm made by public institutions and allowed by the law. However, she argues the epistemic injustice exists before the surgery. So here again her main Goal is to emphasize uh, non-exhaustivity, the non-strict covariation of sex properties. Uh, on the other hand, she also says the idea of sex dimorphism applies to most people, but it cannot be applied to all people and serve as a criterion to divide people into groups. Again, clearly, uh, she is conceding uh, non-exhaustive, sorry, uh, dimorphism, right? She says that sex dimorphism applies to most people. So this, uh, for the authors who uh, both Foster Stelling and Zdeminska characterize sex as non-binary. They agree with the relevant facts. Then on the other side, people who characterize sex as binary, we have Kathleen Stock. I also I already mentioned um, before that this is uh, part of her book from 2021. And, uh, well, she says that humans are divided into females and males and that this binary division is a natural state of affairs rooted in stable biological facts. And she insists for the majority of humans there will be a clear answer as to where someone is male or female. And she says as well, there are occasional cases of DSDs. Uh, this is a medical term that is also sometimes disputed or can be sometimes controversial. Uh, it, uh, it stands for uh, difference in sex development. Um, so she can see that there are some cases of uh, DSDs not easily characterized as either uh, male or female. So in this sense, we could again say that she's conceding non-exhaustivity. And finally, Byrne. In this case, it is a bit more uh, tricky because uh, Byrne already makes an important distinction and he says that there are two meanings um, or two interpretation of the claim sex is binary. Uh, one would be that there are only two sexes and the other one would be everyone is either female or male and no one is both, right? So uh, in, in his paper, he, he focuses on the first one and this is why he, he uses the, the gamut uh, definition and uh, is, tries to dispute the second one although he concedes that, uh, this is the second one, uh, the existence of some unclear cases might be more problematic to insist that sex is binary in the second, se in the second sense. Right? Um, um, something that is going on as well in this dispute uh, in which I won't, that I won't be discussing a lot here, but is as well, um, a kind of um, uh, a debate that is going on is the, uh, the proportion of people or, or cases of, these, uh, of intersex people. And this is a, as well a matter of uh, discussion. Um, maybe if we have time, I think we will, because I think I'm gonna be quick. Uh, we can discuss this as well. So uh, we have authors who characterize sex as binary, authors who characterize sex as not binary, uh, but all of them agree uh, with these facts, right? So, what this, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I, I mean, if, Bestella or la in English, So, should I ask something just in the meantime? I know, I should know it, but, so they all agree, so there are cases where the whole, Gamma X, chromosome, physiological 
features, the whole combination is not the, how to say, the, the, the expected or the, the, or, you know, the one that is supposed to happen when you have male and female. Uh, I guess they all have the same data, like, like they're, I mean, they all work with the same data, that's the same. Uh, so they agree on that. I mean, they agree on the number of cases that do not go out. Uh, not really, actually, because um, uh, so depend. I mean, for instance, um, so if we would try to define this, uh, say, this difference in sex development in the most neutral way, perhaps they would agree. But if the debate is how many people are neither male nor female, then the disagreement emerges because it has not to do as much with the with the data, but with which definition of male and female you, um, you are using. For instance, if, and this is one of the debates actually, that's why Byrne, for instance, who in a sense wants to defend that sex is binary, one of the, his uh, strategies is to say, well, but the number of exceptions is very, 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 very low. For instance, Foster Stelling, who defends the opposite, um, says that the, um, uh, the proportion of uh, intersex individual is 1.7 uh, in 100, 1.7%. And the strategy of Bernie says, well, but if we use this definition of sex, if we only focus on, on gamete size, uh, it's much lower because we might, you might have an individual who exhibits non-typical properties or, or maybe we even has um, external genitalia that don't, do not correspond with, um, with chromosomes, but uh, in that case, maybe they do produce a certain, type of, a certain type of gamete. So even if we might say that they are intersex or that they are not typical, Byrne would insist, well, but they do produce one of the two gametes. So we wouldn't count this uh, individual as uh, you know, not fitting the... Can, can I have a Probably, I, I know that you have been super careful to talk about uh, families and to call us male or female, but I cannot uh, uh, stop thinking, maybe I'm, I'm mixing gender and sex, that I don't want to call a, a trans uh, woman male or something like that. And maybe I am just having that thing, but I want you to clarify it so I can... Um, I'm trying to keep kind of gender identity and this kind of stuff out of the, out of the discussion. I don't know if maybe there might be some uh, tension that might arise if we uh, enter this into the picture, but uh, so because of course, in a way, uh, a trans person, uh, if they have undergone certain um, a transition and they have undergone certain changes, they m might actually fit in this picture where they do not instantiate typical properties of males. But for, the, for this case, I'm trying not to engage in this topic, but I think that it would get things much more uh, messy. Okay, so um, what this so this uh, shows that there is no uh, disagreement when it comes to the facts. There is no factual disagreement. So this suggests, or well, this is at least my interpretation, interpretation that there is a tension on how binary is being used, right? All authors considered I agree with dimorphism and non-exhaustivity, and this suggests that binary can convey different ideas when used to characterize sex. On the one hand. Uh, binary can convey the idea that there are just two relevant kinds. That is, along the lines of dimorphism. But on the other hand, binary can also convey that there are just two relevant groups of people in the sense of exhaustivity. That is the negation of the fact that I outlined. So these are two possible interpretations or two possible things uh, binary might convey when applied to sex. Uh, so of course, the problem is that although sex might be binary in the first sense, when it conveys dimorphism, it is false uh, when used or when it conveys 
or uh, if we follow the second interpretation. If binary conveys exhaustivity in that case, as we have seen, uh, it's false. So, uh, in other words, and to insist, a defender of the binary view could characterize sex as binary to convey something uh, along the lines of dimorphism without wanting to convey uh, exhaustivity. And on the other hand, given that exhaustivity is a plausible interpretation of binary, a defender of the non-binary view could take binary to convey exhaustivity, right, and therefore insist on characterizing sex as non-binary in order to precisely emphasize uh, non-exhaustivity and give uh, visibility to those who fall outside the binary. So this is how I interpret uh, the, the dispute. So this hopefully shows uh, how this might lead, uh, engaging in this uh, um, dispute in this debate through this framework might lead to a false dilemma. Um, as we have seen, it is both problematic to claim that sex is binary and that sex is not binary. The former may falsely convey exhaustivity and the later may falsely negate uh, dimorphism, right? So this is uh, the sense in which I uh, defend that this framework leads to a false dilemma Framing the discussion through this either or question, where we only have two possible answers, uh, unduly restricts the scope of possible alternative as it only allows for obvious implicit positive or negative answers, both of which have the potential to convey wrong ideas about human sex. However, and this is uh, in the paper I take a small detour, uh, so uh, although both uh, interpretations of binary are problematic in a sense, and the paper, I, I also argue that um, one of these uh, interpretations is actually more problematic than the other. Uh, and I say, because, I say so because um, uh, claiming that that's, uh, both um, claims or both interpretations, as we, are, as we have seen, are uh, um, epistemically problematic. They convey something false. But the claim that sex is binary I argue is also uh, morally problematic. And this is so because, as we have seen, conveying exhaustivity amounts to denying the existence of intersex uh, individuals. Uh, and this, as in the case of any uh, stigmatized group, and there has been a lot of, a lot of research done on this, um, when it comes to uh, stigmatized identities, visibility uh, is uh, crucial to, to overcome this uh, stigma and to gain pride uh, on, on their own identity. So in this case, given the importance of visibility to, uh, for stigmatized identities, it is particularly problematic to convey something or to convey, um, uh, when a character is in sex, to convey that uh, intersex people do not exist. And well, there's, um, there has been a lot of work on this uh, not as much in the case of intersex, but in the case of other um, uh, minorities, and it has been uh, studied how visibility is uh, quite uh, important to gain pride on such stigmatized identities. So this would be it for um, the first idea that uh, this framework uh, leads, in a sense, to a false uh, dilemma. And the other one, which I'm still a uh, bit working on this, and I don't know yet exactly how to introduce in the paper. Uh, as it is now, I suggest that uh, another problem of this uh, framework, another problem of asking whether sex is binary in this sort of absolute um, and as an unspecified way, um, leads to the assumption that there is a single concept of sex which is in turn susceptible of being characterized as binary or not. So when framing or when uh, throwing away the, the question in this way, there is an assumption of uh, sex monism. Uh, and this is the sense in which uh, asking uh, is sex binary in this way presupposes sex, sex monism. As I said, the idea that there is only one appropriate or valid concept of sex. And um, what I try to argue is that actually we might have reasons to prefer a pluralist uh, framework where we might uh, use 
uh, the term sex uh, and attach it with uh, different uh, concepts depending on depending on the in the context and the and the relevant purposes. So, the the first re reason uh, for that would be that um, uh, sex is a multifaceted phenomenon uh, that is. Uh, that steers interest from very different uh, domains and uh, perspectives. And it seems that a single concept of sex will not be able to fulfill the different expect expectations and purposes that different agents and institutions place upon uh, this concept. Uh, so at first, one might be reluctant to endorse this sort of um, pluralist attitude towards sex, but it might help to acknowledge that when it comes to other um, important concepts in biology, uh, pluralism is a quite well accepted and popular stance. So for instance, this is the case of the species concept. And uh, so nowadays I think that there are at least seven well accepted uh, species concepts uh, in, uh, in biology uh, and actually uh, most philosophers of biology have come to endorse this sort of pluralist attitude. And just for you to have um, an example of why uh, most biologists and most, most philosophers of biology have uh, come to accept this sort of pluralist attitude, uh, for instance, uh, take the case of a quite popular concept, in bi a species concept in biology, which is called the biological species concept. So according to this concept, uh, two organisms uh, are of the same species when they have a tendency to engage in sexual behavior and when they have the capacity to produce fertile offspring. Right? So for instance, if we put a horse and a donkey together, they won't have much sexual interest in one another. If we were to force them, which is quite a questionable practice, but if we were to force them, they would be able to produce offspring, but um, the, off the offspring is not fertile, right? So this is quite useful to understand uh, uh, species as lineages of an evolutionary tree, as soon as two, organism, two organisms have the capacity to, to be of the same gen gene pool, and well. So this, this concept is quite popular, right? And it seems to be quite apt to capture very important similarities and to explain evolution and so on. But for instance, uh, it is completely useful, uh, useless sorry, for uh, paleontologists. Paleontologists cannot check the um, reproduct uh, reproductive behavior of, uh, of the species they study because they are extinct. So this concept, although it is very useful in some domains of biology, is completely useless in, uh, in paleontology or, for instance, also useless for um, biologists working with asexual species, right? So a concept very popular in certain domains, even within biology, is actually completely useless in other domains. So I think something similar uh, can be said about, about the case of, of sex. So think, for instance, of the so-called biological definition of sex. This is the one mentioned at the beginning, um, the one that identifies uh, males and female by their, uh, the relative size of the gamete they produce. So this uh, definition is very useful to understand sex as a cross, uh, sorry, as a cross species phenomenon, right? Because this is a way to identify males and females across any species that reproduce sexually. Uh, and also an, uh, useful to understand sex as a reproductive uh, strategy. But if we turn to other domains, this way of identifying uh, sex might be quite useless. For instance, if we turn to medicine, uh, this uh, definition is likely not going to be the most useful one. Of course, uh, the same goes for the domains such as uh, sports uh, regulation. If, we, want, if we, we have the goal of segregating males and females, this definition uh, is not going to be very useful. Right? And another possible and the, at the legal level as well. Um, and so uh, by drawing this analogy, I, I mean, there is 
more work to be done on this, but I, I think that we might have reasons to prefer this sort of pluralist framework. And of course, finally, uh, pluralism, this is a disclaimer, pluralism does not solve uh, the ongoing debate. I, I defend it or I put it forward as a way, I think, of uh, going on with many of these debates, but with, a, I think, with a more uh, fruitful uh, conceptual framework. And this is it. Thanks. So, time for questions, comments. Talk um, about sex monism at the end. Um, it seems to me we can also talk about binary monism. So, some people say, you know, I mean, I think a reasonable reading of the word binary would be, could be, continuous but massively bimodal. Mm -hmm. um, most of the readings of binary in your survey you know, are not that reading, right? They're not ex mm -hmm. categorical and exclusive. But the continuous and massively by mode seems, seems a, a viable reading. Mm -hmm. Would you, would you mm -hmm. design this to you? Yeah, of course. I, mean, I guess that uh, some of the people who uh, insist on characterizing sex as binary. Mm -hmm. um, they are aware of these sort of uh, uh, rare or uh, infrequent cases, yeah. so I, I guess that they would, they would, uh, they would agree, and they would think that it's a plausible interpretation of binary. Uh, but uh, I still think that there is this other plausible interpretation of binary. So, I mean, we could enter in a debate to try to determine whether there is one side using the term appropriately or not. But I don't know uh, how we would solve such a, a debate whether on the, I mean, the fact that people is using the term in these kind of different ways. Mm -hmm. So I don't know where we can turn to, to try to. Uh, Let me try and press the point. I agree with you that this Kathleen Stock and others would, would grant binary as massively binary. Right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Would the other side? Yeah, and I, I mean, they, they, I think they, I mean, yeah, they they, I mean, they might agree that, I mean, I don't know, I mean, uh, as if I am right in my interpretation, their aim when uh, using uh, binary and when saying that it's not binary, they are using it in another way. Yeah. Well, they use because they are, yeah, they are, they are, I mean, they agree with the facts, but their interpretation of binary is that it is not this kind of um, bimodal with certain infrequent cases in the, in the middle. The way they are interpreting binary is that it is a kind of categorical distinction, and this is why they are insisting on... Yeah. So what, what I, th I think what I'm... You have for me to think through this, but I think what I'm proposing is if you grant continuous but massively bimodal, both sides get what they want. One side gets to continue. If we would yes. be able to uh, stipulate that binary has this meaning and there is a, but I, I don't know really whether we can do so. <coughs> but I see what you're, uh, okay. you're suggesting. Thanks. So I guess, I guess, I mean, I, I see how pluralism is a form of defending. Okay, we can we can talk about dimorphic, but no more than that, uh, because I mean, we, we defend the, the form of whatever that is. You know, the gamut difference, but no more than that. And then you have the plurality. So I mean, you, you still stand. Um, the idea of, of saying talking about iPhone, iPhone I, mean, I, I have doubts. And actually, when I tried to publish it, and some of the both of the referees pointed to the doubts I already had, they end up. I mean, I end up. And uh, actually, the thing was the doubt I already had because in the previous version I suggested, well, I identified the same problem with binary, and I suggested that well, we might be, we might prefer using dimorphic instead. 
And the reason I said so, because one can think that you know, dimorphic has a potential to, to have the same problem, to convey both, I mean to convey the both, both interpretation of binary, it seems that dimorphic could as well. Uh, and so the reason I said that it's preferable dimorphic is because uh, we can characterize dimorphic uh, with uh, qualitative uh, adjectives, or we can uh, say almost dimorphic, or we can say extreme dimorphism. Again, this can be done as well with binary. We can say, we could say almost binary. So if we say almost binary, we could convey the idea that mostly there are two morphs or two, two ends of a spectrum, but some cases not. And so Stigla said, well, but with binary, we never do this. We never qualify binary. It's always either binary or not. And dimorphic, there is literature where uh, people tend to uh, qualify it and to characterize it more specifically. And this I tried to make an argument for why it was preferable to use dimorphic. Uh, but again, it was not, I mean, yeah. I think that it might have the same problems that the binary. Oh, thank you. Uh, I like the fact I'm very clear. Uh, thank you. I agree. I agree. But, uh, I have some doubts or some questions. Some I started, they started being minor, then maybe they reflect something else. And uh, I'm trying to, to make it clear. So you, 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 I share my thoughts with you just to, to ask what you think about it. My uh, initial uh, silly question was about quotation marks in the title, right? There's a story of that kind of thing later. But you know, why the question marks in the, uh, to the question, right? In the, in the title. I mean, is that it's sexy. <laughs> Uh, binary, and then you know, I said, why the question? Why does the food, you know, question marks there? Are, are mentioning something? Why, why is it not, it's not asking the thing? What, what is you talk, going to talk about? Quotation marks. Yes. Not what did you say? Question marks. Yeah. Quotation yeah, yeah, marks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Quotation marks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is he mentioning it, or, or is he talking about another word as well? Is he talking about language, or is he talking about biology, right? That was my doubt. <laughs> Right? So are we going to learn something about philosophy of sex or you know whether it's this binary or not? Or not? That it seems to be about language, the word binary and the word sex. So now I understand what this um, So and is, is yours an exercise in conceptual engineering, like revising the term we use for in certain areas of philosophy? And the concepts that you know are expressed there, and maybe uh, how is the, the, the words Haslander uses for the concept? The, you know, the thing, the old concept, and the, sometimes we, we should propose reforms of language mm -hmm. and saying, well, instead of having male and female, we need male or I mean, or specimen with uh, big gametes and but but this kind of I mean longer. <laughs> Longer terms instead of just sex, or or are we doing something like Roland Steele that would use ad hoc concept for each use of this? Of this, uh, are, are we talking about pragmatics or semantics? Uh, are we trying to reform language uh, uh, for you know to avoid epistemic cases of epistemic injustice or or sloppy use of terms? Uh, that would apply also to gender. Now the debate now in Spain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. laws and all that. Um, so I think that was that was my question or whatever. My thoughts. <laughs> so on the first, on the first <laughs> of the, on the quotation marks, I think there there's a, a sense. Of I what I try. I mean, maybe I'm not using them properly, but I'm trying not to be asking the question myself in the in the title, because what I'm trying to suggest is what we should stop asking the question. So it seems that what I'm, I'm not, I do not want to be asking the question myself. So maybe through the quotation marks, I am kind of distancing myself from, from those people who do ask the question. And on the other, uh, with, regarding the other thing, I think we, it could be framed within, a, or it could be seen as a proposal in, in conceptual engineering, a very broad one. Uh, but if we understand um, um, a defense of pluralism, I think it can be uh, 
consider uh, uh, a move in, uh, in conceptual engineering. More so when we uh, realize that there is no dis factual disagreement, but still there are some remaining disputes uh, to be settled, and in particular issues regarding how we use the terms, which concepts we should use, and these are, might not be factual, uh, but they are significant disputes where both um, epistemic and moral considerations might intervene in, in how we should talk about sex, which concepts we should use, um, which concepts should be attached to the term sex, because I think that this is something that I need to work more on, but um, I think there might be cases where we want, within this sort of pluralism, where we might uh, use certain concepts in the vicinity of sex without calling them sex. And I think that this is actually already being done in a sense. Uh, for instance, uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, sports legislation, uh, so for uh, some time many sports institution used to uh, have sex verification tests. Uh, at first they were kind of, you know, just go naked and we will check you. Uh, of course, only for females because they were considered the only ones that would, um, you know, participating in a female category. If it was a male uh, disguised as a female, couldn't be seen as a, so it was only females who had to be checked. But then the latest kind of regulations do not call these tests as a sex verification, but they call them um, eligibility criteria to participate in the female category. So what they are saying in a sense is, well, we are going to do this test to determine whether you can participate or not, but if you cannot because you do not meet the criteria, that does not mean that you are not a female. So it's one in a sense what they are trying to do. So they are trying to maintain the segregation, but without committing to them uh, determining whether, you know, what's, what is a female or not. But in a sense, of course, they are using a concept in the vicinity of, of female, in this case. Yeah. I forgot the question. What's the paper? You mentioned my paper, my paper, you didn't give us a reference, or you didn't share it. Oh, well, I was going to share it. Uh, uh, it's a uh, sense. Uh -huh. Yes. And you got review response already. Uh, I don't know when, but uh, oh, okay. yeah, I mean, there was a previous version okay. which got rejected, and then this is the new one. Let's see how it goes. So, uh, can you go to the slide where you, you talk about why uh, might be morally wrong to use binary? That one? Yes. And explaining that you you prefer in answering in your lambda to my question, you prefer not to enter into the into the field, into the topic of identity, but then when you talk about why is moral wrong, you suddenly start talking about identity. Yeah. And I was like, wait, what's that? But what gender identity? So I wanted to. I mean, I, I, yeah, yeah. I might have contradicted myself, but uh, 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 introducing gender identity and, in particular, all the trans issue, uh, I wanted to not engage in with that here. Maybe I should, but I so made if things. Sex identity, would we, would oh, so I, what I'm discussing sexually. here. So um, my my, what I'm uh, discussing here is uh, intersex identity. So people who have been, uh, in a way, uh, stigmatized or people who have undergone uh, unwanted surgeries uh, when they were newborns, mm -hmm. and so people who hide their intersex condition. So all these kind of uh, stigma around the interse uh, intersex identity, but not in a sense of gender identity. I mean, then there is here, not all people with intersex, I mean, I don't have the data, I don't know whether they exist, but not 
uh, all people with intersex condition would like, I mean, they don't identify uh, with intersex as a gender identity. Some might, some might say, I'm not a female, I'm not a male, but many people with intersex, intersex condition uh, are proud males, proud females, and so here what I'm not discussing is not intersex as a, another gender identity, but as people who have this... Uh, okay, no, I, I, I understood that the problem was more about introducing the idea of being in the debate, the fact that how one identifies in gender or in sex, so yeah, that you didn't want to get into how... Uh, how it uh, how affects the... the yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, going to uh, plural, uh, sex pluralism, uh, I think that you, you're, I'm trying to find question first, uh, you are uh, putting different uh, definitions of what sex means depending on each one. Yeah. Um, so then I have like two. But it's, it's a, it's a, just to clarify, it's a normal. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe these sort of meanings are not already, some of them might be already in circulation, but some might not. And so this is the claim that we should be using different meaning of sex. Maybe in some cases this is already going on. Uh, but it's a claim that we should do so. Just. Um, I had two questions. Like, um, how content dependent can we be? Because, for example, I was thinking that in medicine, I guess it's not the same uh, if I am a gynecologist or if I am a hormone. I have to test uh, hormones or something like that. So, how specific it has to be? Uh, and when. Because up to a point, it stops being practical. Yeah, sure. And on, on the other side, like, do they have its definition uh, sticks to different parameters? It, it's like intuitively, it seems like, uh, for example, in the sports, I don't know exactly what the eligibility criteria is, but it's, for example, it's hormones uh, right now, I don't know yeah. what is that. Uh, then you are just picking the kind of characteristic, uh, you, are, you don't care about the gametes or about the uh, chromosomes or anything like that. And um, does this, depending on the, on the uh, definition you are using, pick one thing or the other or a group and how, how does this work? These are great questions. Uh, they don't have uh, answers. I mean, this is the, what I guess that is the next uh, step to be done once if we, you know, if we go on with the pluralist project, so on, is so, sort of thing that would not need to be, uh, you know, case by case uh, discuss uh, the, uh, the advantages of using a specific concept, uh, the both epistemic, both, well, you know, it, it allows for uh, good generalizations, it is uh, operative, both the, the, on the moral dimension of the concept as well. Um, of course, we should take, need to take into account as well the, um, you know, how easy or how viable it would be to actually implement this kind of stipulated meaning. Uh, so in that case, I think that all, the, all these sort of issues would need to be taken into consideration for each kind of uh, case. Yeah. But uh, I mean, it's not easy at all. And of course, and it's kind of an ongoing debate in uh, conceptual engineering and so on that you know, philosophers are, are discussing on how we should be using words and so on, but uh, then when it comes to implementing them, uh, we have zero, um, you know, uh, power to, to, to bring about those changes. Any more questions? Comments? So, they will come in here. Thank you very much. Thank you.